Hey, everybody. I want to thank you guys for joining our Favorite Things podcast. Uh, we can't do our normal intro. Tiff is not here today, and she hates she cannot be here. She had a, a little thing she had to tend to, uh, which I hate as well, because this was her idea to do this show. Um, so uh, we were going to have guests anyway, but she was going to be a part of it, but she, she had to uh, run out of town real quick. So hopefully safe travels coming back, Tiff. But I have with me uh, some great guests. And as you guys can see, as you're watching this, you saw the, the name of this show we're doing is called the it's Summer of Soul. And it's a documentary and um, we're going to get into it well. But let me first introduce my guest. Um, first of all, I have you might know him from a couple of movie club <laughs> episodes we've had. But he's also if you don't know, he's a great guitarist. I play with him all the time. Uh, amazing. Uh, really, really uh, great about his craft as well. Mr. Jason Robinson. Jay, how you doing today? What's going on, Monty Mott? Hey, man, thank you for joining me. Also, I have a new friend that we're making today. Um, when I watched this documentary, I was so taken by it. I went online and I just wanted to see Instagram if anybody was posting about it. And I saw her post about it and I looked at her page and I was so impressed. Um, and so uh, she's a, a singer of, of renown and uh, we can also get into her career if we got a little time as well or we might just bring you back but we're going to talk about the uh, documentary it her name is Changa Murray and we're going to go with Changa but uh, for, the, for the podcast but how are you doing today I'm doing well it's really great to be here and I, I tell you I uh, was looking forward to meeting Tiff as well so as you said safe travels and Maybe I will get to meet her, but I'll start tuning in so I can check her out as yeah. well. Thank you for having me, though. Oh, awesome. Awesome. I thank you guys for doing that. So let's quickly, uh, if you don't know, there's an amazing uh, music documentary. It's on Hulu right now. So if you got Hulu, you can check it out for free. Um, and it's done by Questlove of The Roots. If you don't know Questlove, you might have seen him by now. Big Brother, Afro pick on drums with the uh, Roots crew. He's with uh, Jimmy Fallon and they've done, I mean, you got time to go into his whole archive. I mean, he's a legend of his own right. And he actually put this together. He uh, put this documentary out. I'm sure he had to uh, use a lot of resources to do it, but I'm glad he did it. And it's it's basically, it's the, the Harlem Cultural Festival, which was held in uh, Harlem, New York City in 1969. Uh, and it was basically a, a six week summer festival highlighting just some amazing artists of that time. And this is really the first time it is being shown to a large audience. And so when I watched it, it, it struck me. I talked to Jay, he said he was already watching it. And of course, Changa as well. So um, let me first just ask you both. I'll start with you, Changa. Uh, what did you, how did you feel about this documentary? You watched it front to back. How'd you feel about it? I was overwhelmed by it. I, I uh, s several things, of course, I thought, how, why didn't we know about this the way we knew about Woodstock, um, which, uh, yeah, there was that, but just, um, just having all of that talent there, that audience, just having that audience there of black people, that sea of black people was just, overwhelming, awe-inspiring. Uh, it, it was incredible overall for me. Um, for me, it it was, it hit me on like three different levels. Like for me, it, it really touched me as a, as a Christian to see how influential gospel music was during that time, how they had Edwin Hawkins and Mahalia Jackson and the Mavis sisters and how much gospel music really was a part of that time and a culture. It also hit me as an African-American to see that type of unity, um, to see all those people come together like that, that you really don't see anymore. Um, so it was very powerful for me. It really touched me on many different levels. As also as a musician, to yeah. see the high level of musicianship um, from, from some of the bands and things like that, it was incredible. Most definitely, I, I concur with both of you all. Um, and so, and, and Changa, I'm gonna say, like you said, I was watching it and the same feeling came over me when I watched the movie Hidden Figures. I was enjoying the movie and then all of a sudden I said to myself, why have I never heard of these women? And I said, why have I never heard of this music festival before? 1969, so 
2021, and I'm just now hearing about it. And for those that, that don't know, and it, it, it's 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 amazing. They they had six different uh, sets of weeks, and they had a total of 300,000 uh, mostly African American people that descended on Harlem for these uh, concerts. And it, I mean, to see that, like you said, to see that many people. But I was a little perturbed that why was this not shown before? But uh, it really resonated with me. And so very, very quickly, I'm gonna just hit some of the, some of the people they had. Um, as Jason said, Helen Jackson was there, Stevie Wonder, David Ruffin, Nina Simone, B.B. King, uh, Ray Barreto, uh, the Staple Singers, uh, the, the Gladys Knight and the Pips. I mean, they, I mean, this is not like indie artists. These are huge, you know, yeah. people in the day. So. Um, I'm going to now ask, Greg, this is probably going to be a hard one before we get into some more things. Who was your favorite uh, artist to watch in that uh, festival chamber? Uh, you know, I I don't know why I assumed you would ask that. And I cannot answer it. I am so sorry. <laughs> I cannot answer that. It was just, I felt like when I said it was overwhelming, it was it was like I said, a sum of things, but act after act after act, you know, it was like, I'm gonna have a heart attack in here. I mean, every, it was, um, everyone was a headliner, you know, and uh, I, I, I cannot pick, I may can point out some moments um, that stand out for me, but uh, who my favorites are, I, everybody was incredible. And even the music that I, you know, that I typically don't listen to, I was drawn to those artists as well. So I'm sorry, Monty, I can't pick. <laughs> Jay, did you have a favorite? Oh yeah, without a doubt, man. It was that um, Mahalia Jackson. And um, cause I didn't know the Mavis sisters until you told me like, they sing that song, I'll take you, that song, I'll take the you. Staple there. singers. Yeah, the staple, staple singers. singers. Yeah, so it was uh, Mahalia Jackson, the staple singer. That was a powerful performance, man. I yeah. didn't, I mean, yeah. that was incredible. Yeah. Okay. When she, was it America the Beautiful? I can't remember, but there was a part where Mavis Staples says Mahalia asked her to help her out sing. They sung, yeah. man, I'm, I hate that I'm missing this stuff. But honestly, I'll, I'll concur a little bit as well because I have seen Mahalia Jackson sing. I never seen her in a festival like that. Yeah, neither have yeah. yeah. been cut, And she just blew me away. I never yeah. seen her like that, but also, I mean, I really, they they get into it um, with the fifth dimension and they talk about their, the perception of them at the time. And Marilyn McCool was there and Billy Lewis and they kind of talk about how this was an opportunity for them to kind of break out of, they were kind of in that nice artist type of thing and which I, I really enjoyed them. Uh, Stevie, of course, I mean, oh, yeah. you know, you know what, what more do you need to even say about that? Uh, I like too that they had different, you know, like I said, they had gospel, they had Latino uh, yeah. artists come and there was really a sense of unity. And I'll, for those who don't know, or some of our younger viewers, 1969, there had been a lot of tumultuous things. We had yeah. lost, of course, JFK had died. Then uh, Malcolm X had been yeah. assassinated. Dr. King had been assassinated and Robert uh, Kennedy. So yeah. for a lot of people in that community it was very devastating. And the, the festival helped kind of, they were trying to heal some things. Now I want to, let's get into some really kind of more uh, hard things because why do you all feel like this is the first time we're seeing this? What, do you have any kind of theory upon why they spent all this time to film this and had all these great people come and then they just kind of put it in a storage bin or something? Do you have any any theory on that, uh, Chang? I, I would only think that it was, um... I guess a couple of things, uh, maybe it was just one of those, and, and some of the audience, people in the audience may have alluded to it or maybe someone said it, but it felt like a once in a lifetime thing. And um, and so maybe that was the thinking, let's put these, well, they filmed it. So there was obviously the intention to show it and so my second thought is resources. And then maybe people um, leading it, the, the effort pass on, I don't know, and they just 
end up in this basement. Um, but that's that's all I could um, come up with. And then how did it make its way to Quest Love? Uh, that that would be an interesting story to know, unless you all already know that. But um, yeah, I would just think maybe resources or just it, it was just forgotten. Maybe that's what my hope is. <laughs> anyway, that that it wasn't anything uh, malicious. Uh, again, my hope. Jake. Well, I think that I think that's that same year Woodstock was going on, which was a predominantly um, Caucasian um, festival, music festival, and I think that kind of overshadowed because I had never even heard of the Summer of Soul, yeah. and that's that's what's more surprising. Like you have these notable artists. I mean, Stevie Wonder was huge at that time. At 19 years old, he had for once in my life, so he already was a successful artist, and so for him to have been in that, that type of um, festival and for that not to be widely publicized is very surprising. But I think that in this country, we have, a, this country has a history of suppressing a lot of black history and black culture. Um, I know when I was in high school, I didn't learn a lot about black culture. That wasn't part of the curriculum. Yeah. So it's not until you take a personal interest like St. Louis Questlove did. So you want to dig deeper into where we come from and some of our roots and some of our culture. Um, and I think that's the saddest thing about us. Like even, you know, when you think about the Jews, they, even from the biblical times, their culture has, has permeated down through the generations. Um, Italians, um, we just seem like a group of people that our, our, our culture has just been um, kind of washed away, man. It's very sad. It, it is because again, I can see if this was like some little thing at a club with just maybe two or three artists, but the, you know, Edwin Hawkins in Oh Happy Day was one of the, I mean, that wasn't just a gospel chart. That was a Dude. top song in the pop chart. It wasn't yeah. like they were just getting some mom and pop people. Like, I mean, you know, Gladys Knight and the Pips. Come on now. Yeah. Like, that's, they had David oh, Ruffin in there. David <laughs> Ruffin, The Temptations. The, I mean, and there, it was just, and so I can't really, you know, I can't really put my finger on it. And 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 I'm like you, Chang, I would love, I. I was trying to see if there was something, and he, uh, maybe he's told a story. I would love to see how Questlove got this. I know he's a music savant, and he's probably got hundreds of thousands of albums and things, but to find this gem and then to bring it to us, uh, you know, can't thank him enough. And so I want to move on. Um, I can't remember if it was one of you all kind of alluded to the crowd. And I just, it, it, it was so amazing to see that many African-American people come mm -hmm. together with all kinds of music, you know, all kinds of experiences. And there was such uh, unity and yeah. it, it just, it made me feel good to see that. Yeah. I'll, I'll ask you guys, what was your kind of impression of just the people, these beautiful faces that you saw throughout the crowd? Chango, what was your impression? Beautiful is the right word. It was beautiful. And, and then I think they were almost one of the acts themselves. Yeah. Uh, just watching them dance, the dances of that time, uh, up on shoulders, up in trees. It, I mean, they were almost another act in this film. Um, it was so beautiful. It, 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 they made me wonder, and I think Jason may have said something like this, um, or maybe it was you, Monty. Uh, you know, we don't, we're not that now. I, I don't know, I, but I, to give today the benefit of the doubt, I, I, I haven't gone to um, many festivals. Um, and then when I do, and, and I am a jazz vocalist, so when I do, it's usually a jazz festival, and it is not a sea of black people like mm -hmm. that. So yeah. it was. Uh, it was inspiring and it made me remember who we, and I hate to say were, who yeah. we were then. Just powerful. It, yeah. it felt powerful. Yes, Jake? Yeah, like for me, the, the, the first thing I thought of like, wow, nobody's getting shot in this crowd. Or <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, there's, cause I grew up, I'm from West Side Detroit. So when you have, unfortunately, in the inner city like Detroit, Chicago, um, when you have that many people come together, you there's usually some type of incident that may occur, some type of violence, somebody gets shot. And I think that just speaks to how um, 
I think back then, like unity was a big thing. We were all coming together because we were all fighting social injustice. We were all trying to um, fight against oppression in, in, our, in this country. So we were all united. You even see the Puerto Ricans coming in the, in, the, in the festival, in the footage. Puerto Ricans were coming together like, hey, we on the same mission as the Black Panthers. And I think like um, just during that time, it was, I think it was a powerful quote in there. They said during 1969, that's when the Negro died and the Black um, was born. Mm. Uh, I thought that was a very powerful statement. He said, because back then it was, it was almost taboo to be Black. Yeah. But there was just yeah. such a, it was, they were so proud of who they were as a people. They had an identity. And I think um, that was just so beautiful to see. Well, and, and, and you know, again, we, we remember it because I believe this was a little earlier in the year and then Woodstock. You know, Woodstock was a wild scene. It got kind of, it got crazy. Yeah. And I, I, right. Yeah, you know, and I, folks, I watched- Folks was doing a lot of drugs too, man. Psychedelic stuff. You yeah. know, and, and then I just watched another documentary about the Woodstock that they tried to redo, which was extremely violent and, you know, very crazy. And again, so to see, you know, us in that capacity, 300,000, yeah. you know, from what we know, the documentary doesn't report of anything very really nefarious happening. It was just so beautiful and it was such a, uh, a refreshing thing. And again, that's why I wish we could have seen this earlier and showed this to generations before this um, as well. So now Chenga, you kind of hit on something I wanted to ask you as well, because you've been to festivals and you performed and you kind of already hit it a little bit, but the feeling that you, do you feel like now these festivals are maybe more commercialized than they are just, cause you know, Jesse Jackson was there and they were yeah. talking about, you know, do you feel kind of like that now it's just kind of about just whoever wants to come and, you know, it's a little more uh, commercial that the festivals are instead of what we saw in, in that one. Um, absolutely, but maybe from, um, a, yeah, no commercial is the word um, because I think of what's happened to jazz festivals. And again, that's, that's my lane and that's what I'm best to speak to. Um, you know, a jazz festival will have Gladys Knight on the ticket and she's not a jazz artist. And, but that will sell tickets to that festival. So yes, a uh, commercial is the word. And again, it's from that perspective of uh, what a, you know, the Newport Jazz Festival uh, is, you know, these sacred jazz festivals, um, you know, and maybe because it's the genre too is sort of, I wouldn't say dying. I would never say that, um, but uh, it's not the most popular. I think there's this, um, there's this website that shows over the years how different genres have gone to the top and come down. And, and jazz is, is on the lower rung now. And, and in the 40s and 50s, it was up there. So that's probably when the jazz festival was a pure jazz festival. Um, but yes, it, it is commercial. And then as a business owner, I have to understand that. I, I have to understand that some of the organizers do have a good heart that they want to keep this music alive and if they have to throw in um, a, a pop artist to to do that um, you know maybe it's necessary yeah and it's interesting jay you talked about the musicianship and i remember of course i didn't say what sly and the family stone is there mm -hmm. and you know i remember there's a part in there where they actually remarked like oh he's got a, a white drummer you know yeah yeah, and, yeah. And the guy is right there, that's been, and people were kind of like, but you know, if you know Sly at all, Sly's gonna do whatever he wants to do. But in terms of just the musicianship itself, mm -hmm. and you know, you play guitar, you know, I, I, I play keyboards and things like that. The one thing that I always say is that music is the uniter. Music mm -hmm. is the uniter of, like I said, we, Puerto Ricans, yeah. Latinos, you know, Listen, if the white cat can play drums, then let him play drums. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's never, yeah. it's, it's never really to me been about barriers in music. True. Yeah. Now, yeah. other factors. I don't know if you've got that feeling too, but when I remember that when Sly came out, that's the first thing I saw, and then somebody commented on it. Too. No, yeah, for sure. Because uh, I mean, I've been working with during the pandemic. I've been wanting to just perfect my my musician, my guitar playing, and take it to another level. And I've been working with. Um, 
some white guitar players that play in predominantly black churches, very skilled players, professional. Um, and they've been, they know the vocabulary. Yeah. Um, and, and, it, and I think, uh, like you said, like being a musician, that's like a real meritocracy. If you can play, they don't care what color you are. They'll let you sit in. But one thing I did notice is like, it seems like the quality of music back then was at a higher level than it is right now. Oh, yeah. Because back then you see all those live musicians, like, like they had like Motown, they had a Motown band and these guys were former jazz players. Yeah. They would bring in and they were the house band for Motown. All of those old records were the Four Tops and Smokey Robinson. These guys were expert on their musicians. I mean, on their, on their instruments. And so you can see like, even now, like um, there's a guy named Rick Beato I'll watch on YouTube, he breaks down music. Yeah. He'll go to Spotify and get the top uh, music and he'll just show how simplistic the music is now and how it's not as wow. it's not as intricate as it was back in like the '60s and the '50s and the '70s. So music now, I think is I think the quality of music is is just completely diminished in these times we're in now. That's very true. You know, yeah, there's no computers back then, and you yeah. know, fix everybody's voice and all. That. Yeah, there's no auto tune. Like you had to have real skill. You like you see, really, I yeah. mean, that festival started. Stevie Wonder was on the drums, and oh, then yes. at that. That's how it started. Steve yes. was playing the drums. I mean, then at the end, he playing the clap, like oh, killing yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's I forgot about that. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, he is, and it's uh, it's funny though too because even now I'm kind of remembering. I don't know if any of you know, you know, Sinbad, the comedian, used to have like a kind of an essence fest type of thing where he would kind of bring together and. And even that, it was, I watched that on YouTube once. I was like, man, people were so, it was just seemed different than it is yeah. now. I know, you know, now, of course, even in 2021, we haven't had very much of anything because of the pandemic and all that stuff. I truly hope watching this uh, for younger generation will inspire people to get back to the roots of what is something that is pure. Uh, and and Chenga, you, you hit on it so great in terms of, you know, even being a business owner, we've had to kind of adapt and do things, but, you know, if we could just see how things were, and and, and you know what, the music is still the music, you know, a, a C-sharp chord is still a C-sharp chord today, like it was back then, and just kind of, it, it just made me very nostalgic, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, so, guys, we've had a great time, I don't want to cut anybody off, if you got any more points, please, give me anything else if you had any more uh, impressions from the, uh, from the documentary. I, I do have one thing I want to say to anyone who has not seen it or maybe who has seen it and didn't do this, but watch until after the credits end. There's a surprise after the credits. That's just, that's what I want to leave everyone with. I guess I need to watch. I didn't. I, I don't think I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. Oh, you okay. got to do that. You have okay. to do that. See, I, I, I didn't. Okay. They, they put a little stinger on the end. I didn't. Yes. Okay, right. Yes. See? That's why that's 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 why I knew we had to have you here. We had to have you. Uh, Jay, anything else? Any other uh, impressions? Um, no, it was just like I think for me, like I remember when I watched um, like um, the movie about Fred Hampton um, oh, from the Black Panthers movie, uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. Yes. Yeah, I remember when I watched that, and um, it was educational for me because I didn't know the history of everything that went down with him. And um, I remember also when I watched uh, Black Panther, we, as, a, as a black man, we don't see a lot of representation in media. Um, I think you, and, and for me, like to see that type of representation done with excellence. Yes. Um, this was, cause uh, we, you know, we in the movie club. So we listened to the big picture podcast, Sean Fennessy and Amanda Dobbins. And they were talking about how this is like the best movie of the year. Yeah, well, they were, uh, yeah, they were, they were, um, I mean, they were just praising this film. And um, for us to have a, a black man, Questlove, find this footage and be able to put it together and package it in a way yeah. that represents us in a way that it does, I felt a sense of just, um, just, just being very proud to be a black man. Definitely, you know, and I, me and you have had this conversation before. We talk about gatekeepers and people with the key. And Questlove has done enough in the industry that he can get something like this done. Maybe not everybody could have done this, 
but he's been in it enough. He's respected enough that he goes to a big distributor or a production company says, I want to get this done. He's got a voice. So again, thank you for him. So thank you for my guest. Man, I enjoyed this so much, guys. Thank you. Uh, Tanga yes, and Jason Robinson. Tanga, you're going to come back on because we got to have you on with Tiff because I want you. Okay. To that would be lovely. Your career for sure. Um, but uh, please, guys, check us out again. Uh, our favorite things podcast, Mighty Sharp Network. You know that. I mean, well, and, and real quick, Changa, just please give your plugs now because I don't want people to, if they can, you know, because you've got music out as well. Where can people find you? Yeah, um, my website is when sunny gets blue.com, like the color blue, when sunny gets blue.com. It's actually a, a famous jazz standard by that name, when sunny gets blue.com. And I'm on Instagram uh, and, and um, Facebook uh, at Changa Me Ray's Love. So thank you so much. Okay, awesome, awesome. Jay, you know, your upcoming project, whatever, man, you're going to do, man. Let's, let, we got you to gotta put some stuff out. Where are we going to find you at? Give you a plug. Uh, you know where to find me. I'll um, just follow Maine's Temple System Church. You can hear us um, on the great leadership of Prophet Owens and uh, Prophetess Patricia A. Owens. And um, we, um, by God's grace, we have an anointed band led by our organist, Minister Emmanuel Owens. I like that and, guy. Uh, he's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, he's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, guys, thank you again. Please, please, everybody, check this documentary out. It is so you're gonna learn so much because it's more than just the music. They really, I mean, there's people brought to tears watching this, and they're just, you know, it's, it impacts them so much. So, thank you to my guests. Uh, Tip, we miss you. We'll see you guys next week. You guys know what to do. Be blessed. Stay sharp. Thank you, guys. Bye, everybody. Okay.